Welcome, everybody. You know, you're coming in from lunch, um, so I was going to give a little bit of time for people to trickle in. This is working uh, with a Linux kernel uh, in the Octo project. Um, so, anybody's in the wrong session, feel free. <laughs> I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, been presenting for a little while, so some of you already know me. For those of you who don't, Okay. There we go. A little bit about me. This is my vanity slide, my bio. Uh, so I've been working in Embedded since 1996. I've been working specifically uh, professionally with uh, Linux since 2006, but I started playing with Linux in 1999 uh, to build myself a little NAT router for a DSL connection that was open to the world. Um, in the OSS world, I am on the, the board of the Open Embedded Project. I'm also a member emeritus of the uh, Yachta Project Advisory Board and happen to be part of the, um, the technical steering committee for devicetree.org. All which is to say I'm really cool, right? So the more enthusiastic you are, the more enthusiastic I will be. I tend to thrive very much with an interactive audience. So. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, here's kind of the basic outline. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of project advertising. I'm just going to throw up a couple things about what's going on around the conference with the Octo project. Um, offer a little disclaimer about what this, this presentation is intended to be and what it is intended not to be. Then I'm going to dive right in with some basics, and we'll get into more specifics. So this is as much for people looking at the slides later as it is for here. With Time remaining and hopefully with everything else uh, working, I don't know, do I have a little pointer? Uh, we'll get to a live example. Um, as you all know, a live example can many times go wrong and frequently does, so if that doesn't work out, then we'll, we'll move on. But everything's contained on my laptop. Um, so why don't we do a little bit of the advertising. Um, this is a little, uh, you can actually see this placard uh, Oh, never mind. You can actually see this uh, in print form down in the Octo Project booth. This, these are all sessions related to um, the Octo Project, uh, including uh, the Thursday event, which is kind of an, an extra event outside the conference. Um, this is an, I'm going to upload my slides as soon as I done present, I'm done presenting, so you can see this. Uh, it's also available to you in the booth. Um, on Thursday, we have a Yocto Project Developer Day. I will be taking a session there as well. Um, this is lifted straight from the URL down at the bottom. Um, the takeaway is that if you are looking for a way to accelerate uh, your knowledge for the Yocto Project, this is, put in, this is put on by the Yocto Project itself. It's off-site. Uh, it happens to be at my former employer, <laughs> Mentor Graphics. Um, and, uh, we do still have some, I think, registration slots open, uh, so feel free to, to sign up. We'd love to see people here, or, excuse me, see people there um, uh, if you really want to pick up some new knowledge. And there's two tracks on that. There's a beginner and there's also an advanced. So if you already are familiar with the basics, there's still value to be had there. Um, the Octo Project booth. Uh, please go by. Uh, let them scan your badge. This helps us. Uh, uh, Quite a, uh, quite a bit, um, but it also gives you an opportunity to talk to uh, developers and maintainers directly. Uh, we all are, are generally down there or congregating around there and can answer questions or point you to people who can. Um, you can get more information about the sessions that I already threw up. Um, and of course, you can get more information about the project day. There's also some free stuff. Uh, in fact, I don't know if I have it in my pocket or not. Um, uh, um, the stickers, and there's a little Yachty fuzzy thing, and a few other things. And then also we're going to be, <laughs> there's also going to be a chance to win a copy of a book, um, which I reference here, but then I actually talk a little bit more about here. Um, this is the disclaimer. Uh, there's a lot to this topic, right? Uh, there's no way that I can cover everything related to kernel development and the Reactive project in uh, you know, a, a single talk. So what I'm going to be trying to do is highlight some of the things that I think are important. There's a lot of resources out there, and I'm trying to distinguish myself from them. So if I am leaving things out that you find in those, 
it's, a lot of times that's on purpose. Um, I'm trying to just kind of give you what I felt was important for you as a takeaway in isolation. Um, and I also want to call out Scott for, because you're sitting right in my eye line, for you know, putting together some of the best project documentation that I've seen. Um, I'm, I'm very biased, but I really think that this community is extremely welcoming and extremely friendly. Uh, so we love to see new people come in and we love to help new people coming in. Um, we really want to see new people and new faces. Um, so with that said, uh, one of the other things I have to call out is the Embedded Linux Systems with the Octo Project by Rudy. Um, this is a, a really, really good book. Um, I have a copy of it here. This is the book that uh, we will be giving out. I think we're doing one a day. Um, so really good book that uh, covers in depth a lot of the the ins and outs of working with the Octo Project. So with that under our belt, away we go. So for the kernel, whenever you're doing development, you're gonna need some pretty basic things. And I mean really basic. You're gonna need kernel source and you're gonna need a kernel config, right? Um, in order to make it play nice inside the Octo Project, you're going to also need some metadata or a recipe. Now, I'm assuming everybody in the room has at least passing familiarity with the, Rock, the Octo Project. If you don't know everything up here, don't worry about it. Um, and also knows about kernel development. Again, this is not trying to be an in-depth on either of those two topics. We're trying to put things together. So for the purposes of our talk, we need to consider um, different types of kernels. Um, and I don't mean ARM versus x86 or things like that. Um, there's Linux Yocto kernels, which are kernels that work with a set of tooling, and I will go into what that is in a minute. Um, there are what we would call traditional kernels, uh, which are ones that in some cases predate or for various reasons just do not support that Yocto, Linux Yocto tooling. Uh, and then new, and for many of you in the room, the new kernels are gonna be of the most interest. It's how do I get a new kernel that I wanna play with into the system. Um, as I say here, a lot of times this is from semis, but you got it from somewhere. Usually it's in a, a version control like Git, but occasionally you just have a tarball dumped on you. Um, there's no real specific tooling for those types of kernels or for the traditional one. Um, there's, a, there's general tooling that we will make use of. Um, so a little bit more about Linux Yocto kernels, and in particular the, the uh, tooling involved with them. Um, the Yocto project maintains several kernels uh, in each release, uh, and around those kernels is a set of tooling um, that helps, making, helps make supporting multiple platforms uh, with a single kernel a lot easier. That's important because if that's not your use case, this might not be the best option for you. Um, coming in green. Now, we'll talk more about other recommendations in a sec. Um, one of the key benefits that you get from using these kernels is config management. Again, we're talking about across multiple different uh, platforms. We're talking across um, many times tens of, of different types of devices, but you want a single kernel that you can rely on. So managing all that configuration information, this becomes a lot easier um, once you have this full scaffold built up for you. Um, I'm gonna talk more about what a config fragment is. Um, they allow, the, in order to build on that point above where the configuration management, um, the kernel configuration management, I should be careful. Um, is that it's allowing you to break the kernel config into smaller pieces that you can apply across multiple configurations. Um, so this is extremely valuable, again, when you have a lots, of, lots of different platforms. Um, I alluded to this already, but all of this is done, the tooling relies on the fact that you have a very specific setup of the kernel in a Git repository and a set of metadata files in that same repository in an orphan branch. Um, I wanna make you aware of this. I'm not gonna dive a lot into depth on, on how this is done. I'm gonna say that it is done and it relies on this, um, but what we're gonna focus more on is how we use it. Um, this is really kind of the takeaway that I'd like to leave you with. Um, this is an extremely configurable and therefore very complex um, system to set up. Um, 
This consumes a couple of developers on the project uh, every cycle, just to keep these things going forward. Um, so setting it up is time intensive. However, using it is not. And this is where I leave you with this. So since the Yocta project is actually maintaining several of these kernels for you, if you can leverage them, then you get the benefit of already having all this stuff, all this scaffolding built up. Um, and of course, that's also a reference model if you decide that you do need it. I see guys from Garmin, this is probably something that you're gonna wanna look at. The difference between the kernels, uh, there really, uh, there isn't much difference per se, it's just the way that the, the kernel is structured in the Git repository. So for each release that we go through, um, there's a selection process by the kernel maintainers where they will go and pull an LTES kernel, uh, LTSI kernel, um, and uh, usually one other. And you have to go and look at each release. In the release notes, it'll say which kernels are supported. Um, obviously, the, well, I say obviously. Uh, for those more familiar with the project, one of the, the primary uh, validation targets that we use uh, is QMU. Uh, and so there are gonna be things that are a little more specific to making that work right out of the box. Um, but for the most part, they're, it's like with any kernel tree, right? You're gonna have some stream of patches that might vary a little bit, but uh, we're, they try and stay really right on top of, of mainline as much as possible. So you'll see that the, the upcoming release is, does, do you know, Mark, what the, the 4.15? Okay. So, like I said, they try and stay pretty close up with that. Great question. Any other questions while we're at? All right, you're starting to get sleepy again. Um, so I mentioned the different classes of kernels. Um, what about adding one that we just have a kernel tree, um, you know, a Git repository that we wanna do? So the simplest approach for people coming in with a new kernel is just to simply take the traditional approach. You're going to add in the kernel source and your .config, uh, in this case it's gonna be called defconfig, um, directly into the build via recipe. Um, this is gonna rely heavily on a kernel um, BB class. That BB class takes care of most of the, the, the heavy lifting, if you will, of setting up the cross, it takes care of all of the heavy lifting uh, of making sure that your cross-compile environment is, is good to go. There's a few things, though, that you need to, to do. Um, I actually took this example from, um, from Meta TI. Uh, Dennis, are you in here? So um, it, was, it was a really good example of how we do traditional uh, kernels, and I trimmed out a whole bunch of stuff that wasn't really relevant for our talk, so there's a lot more to this. Uh, there's include files and other things in here. But one of the main things I wanted to point out was that you have this nice inherit kernel. That directive inside this recipe is gonna activate almost everything that you need. Um, you'll also notice that this source URI um, is just basically pointing to, in this case, the TI Linux uh, Git uh, tree. So you've got a, a repository out there, it's got your kernel in it, you point it to it, and then you include in the files subdirectory uh, your config. So if you're starting from a baseline config that you found in the tree, you copy it to there, you push all this in, and then away you go. So I'm gonna pause for a minute, see if anybody has any questions on this. Seems pretty straightforward, right? Okay. So I, I'm, uh, as an architect, I find myself many times having to think about what does this really boil down to, or boil up to, depending on how you want to look at it. So what are the really basic steps that we need to do, and how is this different from normal kernel development? So normal, normal kernel development, you've got your tree, you make your changes, you compile, you throw it on a target, lather, rinse, repeat. So what are we doing differently now? Really, the main thing is we need to add this kernel into our build environment. We need to add this into the cross-compile environment, make sure that all of the, the tool chain pieces line up and all of the, the different optimization flags line up so that when, at the end of the day, our kernel compiles into this environment cleanly. So the first step then is to do just that. We're gonna add it in via that recipe example that I showed you. 
or if you're lucky, you already have one that's out there, um, into the build environment. Next thing you're gonna do is just like you would before, you're gonna verify your build. You're going to make sure that it actually runs on your target. If it doesn't, then you're gonna go back and you're gonna start making changes. You're gonna make changes both to the source and to the kernel configuration. After you've made those changes, you're gonna to need to capture them. That's it, All right? Easy, we're done, All right? No, okay, still sleeping. So the main thing is how do we capture those changes, right? You're, the, fundamentally, the steps aren't that hard, but the devil's always in the, de the details. So capturing these changes is gonna influence the way you construct that recipe. I gave you the simple version, which had just the Git repository. Um, it also will, the, the, the way you capture these changes influence the recipe, and of course the recipe by, by correlation is also going to influence how you capture these changes. I know it's very total, it's circular, but the idea is that if you have a tarball, you're gonna do things differently than if you have a VCS. If you are working against a known baseline and trying to modify it, you're gonna do things a little bit differently. So this is a little bit of a, a little bit longer than I thought it was on, when I wrote it, but you know, when you're, one of the, the key points about this, and I already alluded to it, is where you wanna capture your changes. Uh, as with all recipes in uh, the Octa project, uh, you have the opportunity to store those changes as patches, um, or you can also store them as a change in your version control system. Um, again, where you derive your kernel from, as far as a baseline, is gonna drive a lot of times what's the easiest model for you. Um, in most cases, you're gonna use Git. Uh, this same process is gonna apply both to the kernel configuration and also to things like the, the device tree, which I really don't refer to uh, in any other place on here. Um, personally, I, I find that once you get past a handful of patches, uh, in your recipe, uh, it, in, in terms of your, your layer, uh, it becomes um, a bit cumbersome to continue to, to modify that. Uh, so I tend to strongly prefer Git, and then when I get later on, I'll show you the particular workflow that, that I generally adopt where possible. So we're gonna take a little bit of a pause in the middle of this to talk about some specific capabilities and, yes sir? Why would you run two? Um, I'm generally running just one, yes. I've been running uh, two. I'll be pulling from There's actually a tool that I'm gonna talk about called DevTool, which does some of this similar uh, type of thing for you. There, there's a tool that we have in the project that I will talk about in a later slide called DevTool that kind of helps automate some of that process for you. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that more. Again, I'm, I'm having to hit things at a very high level, so certainly come afterwards and we can. Okay. Um, where was I? All right, so you know, again, this is very high level. This is very generic, right? You're talking about um, some things that are just absolutely, you know, run of the run of the mill type of things, but they do have sort of long lasting impact. So if you start using, um, you know, Git to capture patches, then um, and what I've found is that that makes it a lot easier, for instance, to uh, diff patches or find when a particular patch has, has gone wrong uh, using bisect and things like that. You lose some of that capability when you're using just raw patches stored in the layers. So that's part of the reason why I look at that and prefer it. 
So getting into a little bit of BitBake, and this, this goes to ways that we capture those changes. Um, i to keep an eye on time here. Um, so this is, I know this is probably unreadable for most of you. All I did was a list tasks here. This is the, level, the, the kernel tasks. So again, this is more for reference if you're looking at the slides later. Um, I'm gonna highlight a couple of them that are very valuable. Um, one of them is the wrapper task that is around the menu config. So if you've done any kernel development, then you, you're familiar with make menu config. Um, in order to execute in the BitBake environment, there is a BitBake minus C menu config of your kernel. This is gonna pop open a UI uh, that you can use to manually edit different options and, and select them. Um, there are, however, some caveats to this. Um, yeah, I already covered that. Uh, because of the way that uh, the execution occurs in the, the Yocta project environment, you have to make sure that a configuration already exists. So if you just do a, um, if you go and you do a, a creation of a new environment um, for using the OE init script, and you do a bit bake um, minus C menu config virtual kernel, it will fail. You have to execute the configuration first. A simple way to do it would just tell it to build until it was complete. Um, but uh, an alternative is also to use um, the kernel config me uh, command over here. I'm having a hard time seeing this. Um, so this will basically drive the process through to the point where it's completed the configuration so that then the next step would be to issue a menu config. Um, one of the other things to be aware of is that just like the command functions in your, your tree um, on, without the Octo project being involved at all, it's modifying the dot config in that kernel source tree. Well, this is slightly different when you're trying to build this inside the Octo project, so it's building it inside, or it's modifying it directly inside the working directory for the project. And that means that you are subject to the whims, if you will, and it's not really whimsical, but there, there are certain steps that you might take in terms of modifying recipes and things like this that would blow away that configuration. So if you've spent a whole lot of time very carefully selecting options in your menu config and you've got it just the way you want it and everything else, and you think, okay, well, I'm gonna clean everything and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start over and make sure everything looks good. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> Um, I think everybody at least has done that once uh, and has lived to regret this because then you go, oh no, because it blows away that, that working directory and that config is now gone. So make sure that you're gonna capture those changes. Um, there's ways that you can do that um, that involve the next command, but I mean, bare minimum, you can just copy that, that file out uh, of the work directory. So an, another important one, oh, sorry. Um, what did I put up here? Da, 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 da. Oh, uh, one, other, one other point to this. So let's say that you are actively modifying your, your, menu conf, uh, your config via menu config, and you do not want to uh, invalidate previous steps, but you do want to force it to do a compile. Um, because it, the tool changed it directly in the tree, it's not going to necessarily uh, do a recompile. So you use this minus C, which quite honestly, <laughs> I used to use, I just used minus F, which is a force. I didn't use minus C and has some other side effects. So this one is a better way to do it. Uh, Rudy's book, actually when I was doing some prep work for this, was where I found this. So that basically, it's, invalidates the particular S state cache uh, for that task and then forces that task to rerun. So it's a very valuable way to tell it, I just want you to recompile uh, and see if the compile uh, actually works. So little little time saver there uh, in terms of if you don't do this and you do a minus C compile, it will just use what was in shared state and say, yeah, I'm good, and, and move on. Um, so this helps ensure that you you get what you actually changed. Uh, I'm sorry, yes. 
This is one of the dangers of, of spending too much time with something. It's, yes, it's very obvious to me that that's a capital C versus a lowercase c, and those are different. I think I actually put it in another slide. Um, oh, I did, I put it there <laughs> because I thought about it. So yeah, I mean, basically the lowercase c um, is, is where you're gonna see a difference. So I highlighted it in red. Thanks for the question. Um, let's look at one other one here. So again, there's another script inside the kernel uh, called diff config. Actually, I seem to recall that was something that Tim Bird did. Um, it does a nice comparison of a sorted uh, kernel configuration file and then generates just, just what it says, the difference between those. Um, so BitBake gives you a, a way to run that. Um, when it runs successfully, it's gonna actually just throw out a little, uh, uh, a little file path that it has that config file, uh, config fragment, that's what this is gonna be, um, that uh, you, you can go and look at. But that's also in that work directory. So again, you can lose this if you're not careful um, once that fra fragment is generated. Yes, sir? Would there be a virtual kernel on that? <laughs> yep, there should be. Yeah, if you just execute that, it'll say <laughs> um, Yeah, I need to correct that. Uh, but again, it wraps the kernel script of the same name. Uh, it is generating that, that delta uh, against a baseline. So this is actually really part of the reason why the menu config uh, needs to run and also why that, or, or excuse me, why you need to run that kernel config me beforehand because it's part of the process of generating this baseline. And then it uses that baseline to compare against and for, for any changes that you may have made. And when I get to the live demo, I can show you when that gets created. Um, here's some considerations, um, or excuse me, the same considerations uh, are gonna apply as far as the, the menu config because as I said, that config fragment gets dumped into your work directory. Uh, you have to worry about whether or not your work directory is gonna get removed. Still with me? Everybody still awake? All right, cool. Um, so, creating and integrating those changes are the basic developer workflow, right? We've, we've gone through the, the basic first step, right? So now we wanna be able to turn that crank, we wanna make the changes to configuration of our kernel, we wanna make source changes, and we want to be able to have those flow back into our build in a clean way, yeah? So, when you start from an existing kernel recipe, great. <laughs> Seriously, you're almost done. One of the reasons why the Yocto project exists is to make it as turnkey as possible. So for the ones that are currently in the Yocto project, you already have a recipe, it's already integrated into the build system, um, you're most of the way home. You, you now can focus a little bit more on your changes in the kernel. Um, in order to modify one without modifying it directly, as the gentleman in the back was saying about, you know, you're not gonna push the kernel out of word. Well, I'm not gonna push the kernel work. Somebody else might. Um, you, general process, you're gonna go and create a layer. Um, I suggest using the Octo layer uh, tool, which is part of the, the Octo project. There's a Octo layer create. It'll create a skeleton for you. You know, it's funny, because uh, I'm getting told that that was actually removed uh, in the latest release, damn it. I have a caveat at the end of this which says the tools are constantly changing. So, cool, I'll go and strike that. <clears throat> this, was a, this was just a way to, to copy out a skeleton file anyway, so you can find that in, we haven't removed the skeleton files, have we? I haven't looked in the last. You don't know, all right. Anyway, um, so the, at this point if you are, if your kernel supports the Yocto kernel tools, remember I said there was two different classes. There's the ones that currently support the Yocto tools, and then there's ones that are still, we carry them in the layers, they're available to you, but they're considered traditional, and they don't use the Yocto layer tools. So for the ones that fall into that former class, um, you can use that diff config command and the menu config to manually create changes and generate uh, config fragments uh, in order to put them into your layer and I don't think I actually said anything about how to do that, damn it. Um, so basically those .cfg files you can add to your source URI. Um, sorry, I need, to, I need to add that in. 
however, if your kernel uh, does not support the Yocto kernel tools, then really you can still use menu config, but the, your, your config file is sitting in the tree. So at this point, uh, you're gonna wanna copy that out. And if you, go, if you think about that recipe example that I gave you uh, a few minutes ago, that's that def config. So you'll copy that back to your layer uh, and then check that in and then away you go. So that's, that's the basic part of it. And then for your actual patches as opposed to the, the config portion, um, Again, there's, you, you have two different major uh, directions. It's basically uh, add them in as patches or add them in, uh, in into your version control. It is not. There is a way to do that, um, but I didn't go into that here, and it's a little more involved. It's honestly something that I have never done. Um, so there's plenty of people uh, at the project who can talk a little bit more about what all is involved in doing that. Not Dr. Larry more, but there is uh, BitBake layers. Okay. There is no other way to use it. It's BitBake layer. BitBake layer. Okay. Yeah. It's a moving target, so again, the last, I think, point that I put on this, and I'll say it now and then I'll say it again later, is keep up with it. I mean, pay attention to what's going on. Clearly, it can slip by you. <laughs> so and this one's probably more the way that most people think of it. I've got a new kernel I want to actually add into my, my tree. I, what, do, what do I do as far as uh, getting that in there? It's really not that bad. So I already talked about that, that skeleton recipe. Um, if you add that kernel recipe to the build system, see that one above, um, then you've got it integrated into your build system, right? Um, you want to make sure this, this is one important step here. Um, again, this has bitten me before too. Uh, you want to make sure that in your local.conf, you're setting your preferred provider, uh, or maybe in your machine comp, but this is the, the most straightforward way um, to set you know, your preferred provider is now that new kernel. Uh, and that's whatever that recipe is that you created here. Um, going from there, uh, you know, now you've got it integrated into the build system and then pretty much you go back to the previous slide as far as the steps are concerned. Uh, you can use diff config uh, if it's a Yocto tool, if it supports the Yocto tools, Yocto kernel tools, or, um, you know, you can just copy your, your config in. I think the simplest one is just to copy your, your config into def config and away you go. And then patches the same way. So it's, it becomes the same process. Still with me? Cool. All right, so creating kernel patches. You know, this one, I, I really kind of struggled on this slide more than almost any other, and it's because there's so many different ways um, you know, use your favorite editor. We could get into VI and Emacs wars if we wanted to. Um, but, you know, the idea is that you've got a tree on your system and you can create patches with it. So one way to do it, and I don't recommend this, is you can go and work directly in the work directory that we spoke of before. You can go and make changes there. Um, you know, this is easy to get to by using that dev shell, uh, the, the dev shell command. Um, and for a quick you know, check of something, that's probably more than sufficient. But you, you are now, again, at the mercy of that, that work directory going away. Um, it is nice, however, in that you can drop immediately in. You can execute, for instance, a menu, make menu config, and it'll run. Uh, you can do most of the, the operations that you would expect to do in normal kernel development. So it's very low touch, but you don't have a whole lot of safeguards. Um, but it can work. Uh, if you are working against a tarball, you will have essentially no version control, so generating your patches will also be a real pain. If you are working against a git tree, then you at least have git to, to do diffs against. Um, but there's a better way. Um, I, I think I've already covered that point. You can lose work. Um, you can also work you know, with your, with your source in another tree. I don't know of anybody who does this uh, with a tarball type of idea, but most of the time that's gonna be with Git. Um, I suppose you could. Um, but that basically removes the possibility that, that work directory, uh, that source directory gets removed out from underneath you. Um, 
Again, if you aren't using a version control system, please leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you know, you're not going to lose it from accidentally because of, of BitBake, but this can also be a little bit cumbersome because now you're kind of working outside of the Octo Project's build system, and which you know, all of the the layering and capability that you have there is sort of this separate piece. And you do that. I know a lot of developers who do this though when they're really kind of spinning tight on trying to build a particular uh, you know kernel or they're working to get a kernel working functional on a on a piece of hardware. So this is this is fine. Um, remember when we go back to those basic steps, it was added into your to the build system. Then you're going to lather, rinse, repeat in terms of the configure it, make modifications of source, and integrate it back in. Well, if you're testing all of this stuff outside of that process, uh, throwing it directly on hardware, this may, make, this may be your best option to start with. Um, and as I said about the VCS system, you, you can generate patches using something like Git format uh, if you really want to. Um, that is a typo. That should be a pain. <laughs> so syncing patches can be a pain uh, in terms of keeping things up to date. Cool. That was there just for humor. Then there's what I call a dev tool workflow. Um, and there's probably some better term. Scott, do we have an official term for this process? Yeah. For kernel event? I didn't think so. Dev tool preferred. So dev tool. I'm curious, how many people know uh, about what DevTool is? That's good, that's not too bad. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about it for those who don't. Uh, it is a command line tool that, how am I doing time-wise? Uh, I don't know, anyway, I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. It's a command line tool that's gonna make it easier for you to do some of this quick turnaround for recipes. It's not specific to the kernel. Um, it's really there to do similar to what the gentleman in the back was discussing about creating a, a git tree, uh, not a git tree, a git repo that it's going to check out your source into, and then you can easily identify what has changed from the baseline that it started with. So this tries to bring that faster development cycle right into the process for, uh, for the build. Um, it, it creates a temporary workspace layer uh, and it adds it automatically into your bblayers.conf. Um, this is some of the mechanics of how it accomplishes what it is that it, we're trying to do. Um, you can work against the live source. You can generate the patches using the, the git format patch, or um, there, it will actually collect patches. DevTool is smart enough to, when you're ready, it will actually collect those patches and push them up to a, another layer. But it, it basically makes that process a lot, a lot easier. I'm not going to go into a lot more depth on this. Uh, I will highlight one command, um, which I think is up next. Uh, so as I said, it works well with a kernel. And once you have that initial recipe in place for your new kernel, or if you had one that you, you were inheriting from, uh, it's a great way uh, to just simply set up a workspace in that tree that you can begin to make modifications on directly and uh, do so in a, knowing that you can immediately kick off a build uh, whenever you have a, a change set that you're ready to look at uh, and see if it at least compiles. It also, DevTool will help you push um, some packages. I don't think it really works well for the kernel for this uh, down to the target. I haven't done that. I usually load it differently, NFS or something. But this is the command that will kind of kick this off. So dev tool modify virtual kernel um, or your, the name of your specific kernel, um, once again, inside the BitBake environment is going to, one, create that workspace. If it doesn't already exist, it will insert that, that workspace layer into the bblayers.conf. Um, it will check out the source. Uh, one other interesting thing that I hadn't noticed until I really started looking closely at it is that it will also run that kernel config me command. And in the live, uh, the live demo, we can actually see that occur. Um, so capturing those kernel patches then, um, I, I, I've hit on this a couple, point, a couple times. It's because the source that you use a lot of times is going to influence the way that it's easiest for you to capture changes back to it. Um, so, and I'm repeating my own slides here. Uh, 
so one of the general patterns that I have found is that if your kernel pulls a source tarball, then it's gonna be generally easiest for you to collect patches against that tarball. Um, that isn't always the case. There's sort of a, another approach in which you can take that tarball, put it into Git, and then rewrite the recipe in your BB append to go and pull from Git, but that's a little bit more advanced. Um, it's not really that much harder, but it's just an alternative. Really, I'm happiest when it pulls against a version control system because then you're able to create the patches directly. Um, and then you don't have to worry about updating the recipe to include source patches every time. I have had more than one occasion in which I was adding several patches and I missed one. And things really get squirrely and you have to go back and then manually audit the list in the, the recipe. So, as I said, when you get past a handful, really strongly consider using uh, Git version control to, to make this a lot easier. This is, not, this is not really that hard, right? I mean, this is not really all that groundbreaking. That's why I kept trying to boil it down to those basic steps. You want to get this so that it builds in, in the Yocto project, but then you want to kind of let it get out of your way. So that, that is really the, the, the goal for me. Um, is to make this stuff kind of get out of my way. So let's see if I have time here. I'm going to pull up an example. Hopefully you guys are seeing that. So, all right. Let's see. I'm gonna make sure I clean up first. Um, okay, so this is telling me that I didn't have my workspace left behind. Uh, yeah, sure, sorry. It's like my eyes are that much better. All right, there. How's that? Is that better? All right, so. I wrapped this up just so that I wouldn't typo things, but all this is doing is the, the dev tool modify. Um, this is, you can see it going through the steps uh, where this is running in a, a VirtualBox um, VM on this laptop. It's an Ubuntu box, um, and there's a couple of wrappers in place for the shells, but um, it's gonna go out there, it's gonna do the kernel checkout, as I said. It created the, the workspace layer um, and injected it uh, into the BB layers, um, at least the initial time that I ran this. I don't remember if I cleared it before I came. Uh, and then it's gonna take a little bit of time to do the kernel checkout, and it's gonna run through. Now this one is a Linux Yocto kernel. So uh, it runs on QMU x86. Um, that was just for simplicity. Uh, the same step works for, for any other kind of kernel uh, that you wanna look at. And it's gonna take a sec to complete. Any questions? Do you guys remember when DevTool initially hit? I mean, it's been a while. It's been a long while, um, relatively speaking. Um, for anybody coming to it new, it's, it's there, and I, I wouldn't worry about it. There are gonna be subtle changes, uh, clearly. You know, there's uh, some things get renamed, uh, some options change and the like. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, DevTool is there, so. And there is a session on DevTool at the, the Yocto Project uh, Dev Day as well. All right. Since 2014? So yeah, I mean, that's like ancient by open source project standards. Um, so, and it, it continues to improve. Um, you know, I mentioned before, as we're, this is where I kind of do my song and dance while we're waiting for it to run, um, that there was a specific setup uh, that the, the uh, Linux Yocto tooling relied on um, in order to do some of the magic. And what you can see here uh, is not the config me one, see this kernel metadata uh, task there? That's related to the Yocta tooling. So that takes a little bit of time while it goes and it actually, I, I skimmed it very fast, but it's taking all of these different config fragments, there's logic applied to them in terms of machines that they apply to and they don't, and it consolidates all that and then generates a full-blown uh, config for the kernel. Okay, so now we're done. At this point, I now have a workspace. Um, this is not the most stable platform. 
Um, so if I look in the workspace sources, I've got a Linux Yocto. Okay. And you'll notice um, that there is a config in there. It's all ready to go. Uh, if I were to issue a build right now, uh, it will go through the, the complete um, build steps and generate it here. But in the interest of time, let's take a look at uh, the config. Well, actually, let's do, let's do this first. Um, we're going to run uh, QMU. No, we're not. Oh, it helps if you build it first. Damn it. I still my own petard. Build. All right, we'll let it run for a sec. Since I've done this build before, uh, it shouldn't take too, too long after it gets past the config stage. Um, so what the example I'm going to do here is I'm going to basically run through and do the, uh, the menu config. I'm going to alter it, uh, and then I'm going to verify that that change actually ended up in the, in the live target, which is under run QMU. So while this is running, are there any other questions? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry? So there are limitations in terms of, of uh, using DevTool, but they continue to be removed with each iteration. So um, I generally use this with the, the def config file because that's the simplest. Um, but uh, yes, you're right. Behind this, the question was um, DevTool is using external source behind the scenes. That is, that is a true statement. That is a, a way to use an external source tree. And there are occasionally issues with, that I've seen with trying to use .cfg files. Um, but if you force it to go through into the config me stage, uh, again, uh, I, that works for me. Um, so, but more, normally I'm using it in the model where I've got the, I don't use the, the Linux uh, Yocto kernels as much as I'd like. I end up using uh, an, an external uh, kernel that uh, I have to bring in. So then I just have a def config and I manually copy it over. Okay. So this is going to take a minute while it compiles. Didn't think that part through. Any other questions while we're waiting on it? Right. Okay. Right. So the question was, uh, if uh, you are using config fragments, can you go and look at what it generates um, and copy that out and use it? And the answer is yes. Anyone else? Yeah? How about the workflow where you actually need to go in and modify the kernel? You just pull down the kernel from, from kernel.org. Mm -hmm. So what I have done personally is um, I, I use git and add a remote, and then I push from within the workspace. So then I can, I, I, it's checked out from, from an upstream git, um, but since it's, it's replacing git internally in the workspace, this gets into the details of the way DevTool works, um, it's, it's not really con connecting the dots there. So you can go into the workspace, add, add the remote, Laptop's getting sleepy. Um, and you can go into the workspace and add a remote uh, and then push directly. So that way you're getting the benefit of using the version control system to capture patches. So, but that means from then on, you know, if you want to build a game, you want to hand it to your buddy to build, you say, don't clone from kernel.org, clone from my remote. Right, which is the case in most cases, right? If you've got in, in larger than one group, you're probably not working directly against kernel.org 
So if you've got a version control system, you're, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just, the, you're absolutely right. The, the consequence is then, yeah, the recipe is generally not going to pull against kernel.org. So, um, and that's sort of an, an important point that I kind of glossed past. In your recipe, you wouldn't point it upstream to kernel.org because you're not going to be able to uh, round trip it. Maybe, maybe it's not kernel.org, maybe it's semi You know, the, the meta TI layer is pointing to the, the Linux TI kernel. You're not going to push against that. So again, the implicit step there is that you're going to create some version control system inside some place that you can access, and you use that to, to capture your changes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Yes, sir. You want to stand up and smile? <laughs> so I, I mentioned that uh, I previously worked for Mentor Graphics. So OSVs are going to use this more than than uh, the average or larger organizations are going to. Um, you know, it, it depends uh, on the specific semi whether or not they they provide it or not. Um, so uh, it. I make a common effect while we're waiting for this to compile. Why don't I go back to the slide here? Um, let's see if I can jump to the right spot. Um, you know, your, 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 your question kind of hits very much with the first point there. Um, most developers are going to start with a kernel that's coming from a semi or a board manufacturer, right? Uh, in that case, my advice is take the path of least resistance, right? If they have a kernel that supports the Octa kernel tooling, then great, embrace it and use code fragments and use uh, the, the, the normal path that you would take to get, generate um, uh, kernel uh, patches. Uh, but for other ones, use that basic template. Man, I have too many typos in this. So uh, to, to facilitate, you know, bring it into the build system, but then you're kind of working as much as possible uh, in this tight loop uh, outside, which is how DevTool tends to kind of bridge things. Um, to, my, to the point about the use of the Yocta tools, if, like the Garmin guys in the back, you have a lot, a lot of platforms that you have to maintain a single base on, this is where you're going to really derive a lot of benefit from the, from the Yocta kernel tooling. So invest the time up front you got to go look at what the structure is that you need to have and get. And there's a great, um, there's a great uh, kernel development uh, guide uh, that uh, Scott has worked you know, on that helps you to make sure and bring, the, bring that in. So spend the time to do that. I find working against you know, a Git repository and using DevTool, uh, I tend to minimize my pain. That's my pain. So you know, you're going to have to do what is going to work best in your particular environment. Um, and there's my point at the bottom, which is, you know, the tooling continues to improve in every release, so make sure that you keep up with it, uh, or you might end up with egg on your face, you know, in the final end. We're already into questions, and I think I'm running low on time. How much time do I have? Am I out? Whoops. Okay, thank you. <laughs>